you're gonna wanna watch this entire video because in addition to an eye-opening comparison, I've got a really cool behind the scenes story for you and I'm gonna show you a very unique perspective about the tools you can use to set the gains on your amplifiers. If you browse around the internet, you'll find a lot of people with some very strong opinions about the best way to set up the gains on their amplifier. And I thought I would ask you, my viewers, on how you like to set the gains on your amplifiers, and here's what you said. Almost half of you are setting your gains by ears, and about a third of you are using some type of advanced tool like an oscilloscope or a distortion detector to set your gains. What I wanna know, for those of you who are setting your gains by ear, how do you know you can trust your ear? And there's nothing wrong with setting your gain by ear if you have trained your ear and used a measurement device to calibrate your ear so that you know what distortion sounds like. Have you ever calibrated your ear versus some type of measurement device? I ask because I legitimately want to know. Because ultimately, your ear is the single most important measurement device. If it sounds good, then it is good. And the best solution is to use some combination of both. Now, if you're like Tron here, you'd probably like to see some type of comparison between all the different ways that you could set your gains. And that brings us to our really cool backstory. A few months ago, I posted this video. And in that video, I talked about the pitfalls of using a digital multimeter to set your gain. In that video, I mentioned that I'd like to try one of these distortion detectors and see how well it works. Not only did that video get a lot of strong reactions, but Steve Mead himself saw the video and he shot me an email and said, hey, I wanna send you a pair of my distortion detectors. No strings attached. He didn't ask me to give an endorsement. He didn't ask me to make a video. He called it a Christmas present. You see, Steve really believes in his products and he legitimately believes that his tool is the absolute best tool for setting your gains. He said, test it against any oscilloscope. That's kind of a risky thing to do, to give someone a piece of equipment and say, hey, go for it. Well, <laughs> challenge accepted. Let's test this thing against an oscilloscope. Now, Steve and I also had a very pleasant email exchange as we discussed the general process of setting gain. And something Steve said that I wanted to share with you, he said that most people when they're setting their gains are probably doing it wrong. What he meant by that was there's a lot of equipment starting at the head unit going all the way to the amplifier and everything on the signal chain in between. And if the gain is wrong on any of those things, you're gonna end up just amplifying distortion at your amplifier. We're talking about things like bass knobs and line drivers and signal processors. Steve also said there's a lot of dirty gear out there on the marketplace, and that's an important thing to remember. You don't have to buy the absolute best gear in order to have a good system, but you don't wanna be scraping the bottom of the barrel, and I'll show you what I'm talking about a little bit later in the video. So let's grab my trusty scope and my DD1, and let's see how these things stack up against each other. So here is the test setup. I'm using an older Alpine amplifier and I've got the probes for the scope and the DD1 both connected to the speaker outputs. The amp is being powered by a big AGM battery and a 100 amp power supply. I'm using an old cell phone with some 3.5 to RCA adapters and I'm sending the signal right into the amplifier from the cell phone. Now I've tested this cell phone many times over the years and it doesn't clip at full volume. So I know I'm getting a clean signal from the cell phone. I'm gonna play a 40 Hertz zero dB test tone from the DD1 test CD. And then I'm gonna just gradually raise the gain. Now right now I've got the scope in just regular voltage display mode. And I've done that because the oscilloscope mode is not auto ranging. And so you have to constantly adjust the view settings in order to see the waveform. So what I always do is just turn it up to about where I think clipping should happen. I do a little bit of math ahead of time to figure that out. So I'm gonna start slowly turning up the gain. And what I want you to notice is the distortion light on the DD1 is gonna blip for just a second. That is not distortion. The DD1 is more than just a flashing light. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on inside of it. It is an auto ranging device internally. And what's happening here is it's kicking up to the next range. And that's when you see that light blip for just a second. But we should be close to clipping. Let's turn on the scope and see what's going on. Okay, that's pretty gnarly. As you can see on the scope, we've got this waveform that's all broken apart. It's fuzzy and spiky around the tops and the bottoms, the, the peaks and the valleys. 
but the DD1 light isn't on. So you're looking at this thinking, it looks like my scope is telling me that I have distortion, but the DD1 says that it's below a 1% threshold. So what is that fuzzy spiky stuff? And why isn't the DD1 telling me something is going on? Well, since Steve was kind enough to send me this equipment with no strings attached, I thought I owed him an email to ask what was going on with this before I just stuck it out on the internet. He forwarded that email onto the engineer that designed these devices, Tony Di Amore, and here is Tony's response. Apparently, the scope was picking up high frequency switching that is common for class D amplifiers. This high frequency switching happens well above the human range up into the 40,000 Hertz range. And of course, if you're using a class D amplifier for a subwoofer, it's so far above your crossover point that you're never gonna hear this. The reason the DD1 isn't picking this up is because the DD1 is not looking at the 40 Hertz signal, and it's definitely not looking at the 40,000 Hertz signal. The DD1 is watching for total harmonic distortion, and according to Tony, it's looking for the third order harmonic. So the first order harmonic is 40 Hertz, the second order is 80, the third order is 120. More on THD later. Let's get back into what's going on with the scope versus the DD1. So if you're keeping score, I'm gonna give a point here to the DD1. Because even though the scope technically isn't showing distortion, the first time I saw this on the scope, I didn't know what it was. So I backed the game down and left some power on the table. But of course now knowledge is power and I know what that fuzz is. So I know that I can crank the gain up a little bit more when I'm using the scope. In fact, let's crank up the scope a little bit more here and let's see what happens. And one cool thing about filming all this, it allows me to step through the footage frame by frame. So as I'm slowly turning the gain up, what you're gonna see happen here is the DD1 is gonna light up. And then nine frames later, you will see the top of the very first wave on the scope is gonna go flat. Then over the next three frames, the rest of the wavelengths are going to one by one flatten out. So the time between the point where the DD1 lit up and all of the peaks and valleys went flat was a total of 12 frames. I'm playing this back at 30 frames per second, so that took 4 tenths of a second, 0.4 seconds. So the DD1 edged out the scope by 0.4 seconds, which is so close that it's well within just the human error that you're going to have as you're trying to lay upside down in a car trunk adjusting the gain. Now I filmed this same thing a couple of different times, and I noticed that sometimes the scope would actually beat the DD1, and you would get square waves just a few fractions of a second before the DD1 would light up. The real big difference for me is that as I am turning the gain up and down, I have to make a judgment call. How flat can that curve be before it's audible clipping? The DD1 is watching that third order harmonic and when it reaches a certain level, it knows it's hit 1% THD and that's when it's gonna light up. And so the DD1 can remove a little bit of that human error element and remove that judgment call you have to make and that alone might be worth the price of admission. Let's go back to this THD concept. I wanna show you something. This is a clip from an old soundbar review that I did a while back. What I'm doing here is I'm playing a 1000 Hertz test tone and I'm measuring it with a Dayton Audio calibrated microphone and an RTA app on my cell phone. And you can see the 1000 Hertz test tone right here. You can also see a whole bunch of background noise right through here. But you're also gonna notice some random spikes. These random spikes are happening at the harmonic frequencies. This is what the DD1 is looking for. You don't want to amplify these audible spikes that pop up when you have distortion. So you might think, hey, why not just set up an RTA and I can use the RTA to see THD. Well, the RTA that I have doesn't measure THD. You will need a much more expensive piece of equipment than that. And this noise down here at the bottom is probably going to muddy that signal. So there's probably no real way I could use this one to find 1% THD. Let's try this on a different amplifier and see what happens. This is a plate amp that I pulled off of an all-in-one system. I'm cranking up the gain here and when I hit about 20 volts, the light on the DD1 Plus comes on. So let's switch over into oscilloscope mode on the Lumi and see what the waveform looks like. It's, uh, it's not clipping. <laughs> um, 
what in the heck's going on here? Not only does it never clip, the voltage never goes above 31. Check this out right here. This is really subtle. I missed this the first time that I did it. I'm still turning the gain up right now, but the voltage is going down. I'd planned to release this video a long time ago. I didn't have any idea how to explain this. And so I reached out to Sam at BearVids and uh, asked him what he thought was going on. And he said, likely there's some type of limiter or compressor. And the easy way to test that would be to turn the volume down on my cell phone and then turn the gain up. And if it still won't go above about 30 or 31 volts, that that's what's going on. And that's exactly what happened. So thanks for the tip, Sam. So this amp is designed so that it never clips. That's a good thing. This is like a fail safe. This entire all in one system, you could buy the whole thing brand new for 250 bucks. This price point's kind of targeted at a beginner. And so you don't want someone who's not that experienced turning their bass knob all the way up and clipping their amplifier and blowing their speakers. And that's really kind of cool. But as you saw, this thing passes the 1% THD at about 20 volts. And when I first tried this thing out, I rode around in it for about a week and I adjusted the bass knob, I adjusted the gain, I adjusted the controls on my head unit, and I never could really get it to sound good. And well, now I think I know why. Part of the problem I was having is that my scope wasn't telling me that something was wrong. At this point, I'm willing to concede that the SMD device is better at detecting distortion than my O-scope. But I'm not quite ready to recommend this product. I'll tell you why in just a little bit. But there's something else I want to show you first. About a month or so before Steve was kind enough to send me out some of his test gear, I went out and bought one of his AMM ones. This is a fairly expensive unit and I was only able to afford it with the support of my patrons over on Patreon. When you join me there on Patreon, I'll take your support and I save it back until I'm able to afford something like this. So if you would like to see me test out more tools and gear and equipment, check the link down in the description and consider joining me on Patreon. Let's hook all this stuff up to the amplifier and let's see how it performs. Everything's all set up on the bench. I'm gonna use the AMM1 to do a reactive load test. I've got the amp hooked up to the speakers that came with the amplifier. And I'm gonna start turning up the gain on the amplifier. And right here, the DD1 Plus is detecting distortion and the AMM1 is showing somewhere between 77 and 80 watts. This is why I never could get the system to sound right, no matter how much I tinkered with it. It just isn't giving a clean signal. You're barely getting any power out of this amplifier when it starts to distort. I don't know how well you're able to hear it over YouTube, but I did notice a change in the sound whenever the distortion light turned on. And that's what I meant earlier when I said, if you're gonna use your ear, you need to train your ear. You can hear a difference, but you might not realize what you're hearing unless someone points it out to you. Well, you may have noticed the AMM1 has a clip light on it. Why don't we see just how much power we can generate before this thing actually clips? So for this, I'm gonna take the AMM1 out of real-time power mode and put it in amp dyno mode. In amp dyno mode, it's gonna display the maximum power and it stops reading whenever you hit clipping. As I turn the gain up, you can watch the voltage and the power climb and at around 31 volts we get 302 watts I tried it again and I was able to get it up to about 322 watts which is actually a respectable amount of power for what this is so I'm really happy with that but check this out if I will turn the gain all the way down and then crank it up all the way to 11 just as quick as I possibly can you see the power jumps up to well over 400 watts here, I'm gonna try it again. Okay, 477 watts, and the thing was never clipping. Here's what I think's going on. I think there's a compressor on this amplifier, and when you take the gain knob and go from zero to 11 as quick as you possibly can, the compressor is not fast enough to clamp down the power. So when lightning strikes, you can get 477 watts out of this thing. And the AMM1's internal circuitry is just fast enough to catch that peak before the amplifier clamps down the power. All this really shows is that there's a right way and a wrong way to do an amp dyno test, and that was the wrong way. One thing I love about filming all this is that the camera itself and microphone that I'm using actually become part of the test equipment. And in the editing software, 
you can actually see the little blip where this thing hits its peak power. Now, I wasn't able to hear that little blip, and as you can see, it's a very small blip, maybe two or three frames, so a tenth of a second. Now it's time for my recommendation and my unique perspective, and here's what I wanna show you. This right here is the system that I bought when I got back into car audio in my 30s. And when I bought it, all of these items were at the end of life. And so I was able to get a really good deal on it. The subwoofers were $40 each and the amp was under 150 bucks. I think it may have been 130. I picked up an $80 prefab enclosure off of Amazon. And for under 300 bucks, I had a 500 watt system and I was thrilled. It doesn't make sense to buy a $300 tool and use that $300 tool to set up a $300 system one time in five or six years. At the $300 level, what you need is friends who have tools or a buddy that has some experience and knows how to set the gain by ear. And if you don't have any of that, you're stuck with a $10 multimeter from Harbor Freight. But if you use a DMM or an oscilloscope to set up this system right here, your tool is gonna to lead you astray. It's kind of a paradox. If you're using the really low end gear, you need the really high end test equipment to set it up correctly. If you're gonna be using a scope or a DMM, my recommendation is to make sure you stick to the long established trusted brands like Alpine and Kicker and Rockford Fosgate. All of these brands offer entry level gear that's affordable and reliable that'll do their rated power. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're a pro working in a shop, the SMD equipment is the industry standard. And it's the industry standard for a reason. And in my opinion, the main reason why is simply speed. The last thing you wanna do is be laying upside down in the trunk of a car or your body contorted into some weird shape, trying to read a tiny screen on some dimly lit oscilloscope and trying to judge just how clipped a signal is. When you're a pro working in a shop, you gotta get the cars in, you gotta get the cars out, and you have to be fast and accurate, and that is what the SMD products do. If you consider yourself a high-end DIYer, well then you need to go ahead and spring for the best test equipment. It doesn't make any sense to have a $10,000 worth of audio gear and then use a $10 Harbor Freight multimeter to set it all up. Don't be a tight wad and go spring for the proper test gear. For those of us in the middle, that DIYer that likes to tinker, likes to search for budget gems, and might only install an amp once or twice a year, the decision really boils down to one of your own personal budget. And down in the comments, a lot of you have told me that the SMD tools are simply too expensive. Steve has the right to charge whatever he wants and you have the right to buy something else. My unique perspective is that every build is a budget build and budgets are just different. And because of that, my goal as a content creator is not to recommend a particular product. My goal is to give you the information you need in order to make the decision. You've just seen it on film. You know exactly how these two devices stack up against each other. Now, as for me, I'm more than just a DIYer now. Now I also film videos for your entertainment and information. And because of that, it's worth having one of these. I'd plan to save up and buy one eventually. And I've got a running list of all the things that I'd like to add to my arsenal because I wanna show you how these things work and what you can do with them. And more importantly, I wanna use all this stuff to test out gear like amplifiers and subwoofers so that you'll have more information when you're ready to make a buying decision. I was able to save up and buy an AMM1 thanks to my patrons over on Patreon. So if you wanna help me continue to make videos like this, check out the link down below and join these guys right here by supporting me on Patreon. I wanna give a special shout out to $25 patron Dylan and give a special thanks to Steve Mead not only for sending me out the equipment, but for taking time out of his day to answer a lot of my questions. Steve, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I will see y'all on the next one.